We trust the lamb, not the donkey or the elephant. There was one chapter in your book where you talk about George W. Bush and Barack Obama, who were both very public about their faith, and they kind of epitomize these two different trajectories. So could you share a bit more about that? Yeah. I mean, as you said, it's just really heartbreaking to know that we've kind of created this this false choice that, you know, different traditions and people feel like they have to pick a side. And yet that has had implications for us throughout the last, you know, 50, 100 years. Um, I they think we see it both in the way that a lot of kind of evangelical, more conservative Christians do feel some suspicion or uneasiness about being too involved in social reform work. I mean, I remember being in seminary and first hearing someone use the social gospel as a pejorative, like, oh, they believe the social gospel, which mm -hmm. in its most basic definition just kind of means like the gospel has social implications implications, which if we're being honest, both conservatives and liberals agree on that. We might disagree about what those social implications are or what institution should do them, but we all think that the gospel yes. is not solely an individual, spiritual, personal thing. But one side has been tempted to at least articulate it that way or to think that the kind of spiritual condition of people is so preeminent above their material conditions that we don't even have to follow the actual command of Jesus to like take care of the poor um, or the words of the prophets that very often said, it doesn't even matter if you're following the religious duties that I told you to do. If you're mistreating people, if you're not seeking justice and pleading the cause of the widow and the foreigner and the orphan, mm -hmm. I don't even care. I'm not listening to your prayers, it says in Isaiah 1. So we really did often ignore portions of scripture. There's this incredible uh, line from a theologian earlier in this period, um, John Warwick Montgomery, where he says, you know, the liberals use the visible scissors of, of, his, of destructive historical criticism, this method at the time to kind of determine what parts of this are accurate historically and what aren't. And they get rid of chunks of scripture using their interpretive methods. But we conservatives, and he was speaking as a conservative, he said, we use the invisible scissors mm. of just ignoring the passages that make us politically uncomfortable. And that's probably true of both sides, right? Just ignoring either in the prophets, what the prophets have to say about sexual morality or what the prophets have to say about economic injustice. We're selective in our interpretation of those things. And then, as you said, I think George Bush and Obama are a good example, too, of how we continue to have that kind of divide. George Bush really, I mean, his main kind of public Christian presence was, I'm one of you guys. Like, trust me, Billy Graham <laughs> helped me convert. Like, how evangelical can you get days. than having Billy Graham be, you know, be the one to lead you to Christ? And yes, and so he would kind of just rely on this as an identity marker. He was remarkably silent about Christian practice or where he went to church or who was advising money, which maybe that privacy is good. But he didn't really talk about scripture shaping policy. In fact, some of his advisors made very clear that he is not using scripture to shape policy. They were worried he would be perceived as, you know, theocratic. And so he said, no, this is my personal comfort, my mm -hmm. personal guide. This is not about policy. Whereas Obama became a Christian working in community organizing in Chicago, which is deeply connected throughout American history to churches who said what really matters for our response to the gospel is seeking good, flourishing communities. And that requires us to do the work of organizing politically to seek those conditions. And so he often talked about Christianity in terms of the community that he belonged to and the language of scripture, which has its own pitfalls, right? He would often talk about, we need to reclaim the kind of moral language of our country, which has often been scripture and drew on the social reform tradition of Christianity. The pitfall for him could be, we might use language and might use that to kind of signal to people that we're Christian, but is that really the content or the real power of scripture informing the policies that we support? Or is it just kind of similar window dressing, whether it's identity or language? But they do. Part of the reason that Obama, you know, spent his entire presidency trying to convince people he wasn't Muslim was because he came from a Christian tradition that was different than the one evangelicals were often familiar with. Mm. And again, might have had legitimate theological differences with. And yet our history made us convinced that they were irreconcilable, that we can't learn anything from them, that we are in opposition to them, that we can be really thrilled with this like Texas Methodist who Billy Graham converted but we really can't find any common ground with this black community organizer from Chicago who had remarkably orthodox language for describing his Christian faith, but might have had real significant political disagreements with the majority of evangelicals in America. Okay, I, I, I want to have some fun now and go through some passages that have been used throughout American history to various political ends, because I think it illustrates the point that we're already discussing, which is uh, that we are all interpreters of the Bible. Even if you're not a Christian, if you hear the Bible, you've now become an interpreter yeah. of the Bible. And the way in which we interpret those passages has real ramifications for our life together. And as you already pointed out, how we read the Bible going forward. And so I, I'm going to go through a few. You have so many in the book, but I'm going to pick my favorites because 
I'm doing the interview. <laughs> Uh, so let's start with Second Chronicles seven fourteen. I'll, I'll go ahead and read it, and then and then you you can take us to class and tell us how this has been interpreted and applied in American history. So here's the passage: If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Okay, so how has this been used in history? <laughs> This is a favorite of the last, you know, 50-ish years of American politics. It goes a little back, bit, bit back further than that, but this has been a huge favorite, um, including uh, Reagan, who who swore in with his hand on a Bible open to this passage. And so we're, like, really interested, especially in the moral majority period, in this kind of language. Yeah. And I think it's important to say that that's become more significant than it was in the past, in part because in the period in which, you know, the like early to middle 20th century, as a lot of more conservative Christians are becoming at least more obviously politically active and the moral majority begins in the middle of the 20th century as like a movement for conservative Christians to seek a better government from their you know perspective, according to their standards, there was a great emphasis on reclaiming a particular story about America as a Christian nation. And so, of course, you're going to go to passages that kind of talk about our community or the land and kind of want to tell a certain story about us and where we come from. I think it would be easy to look at this passage from Second Chronicles and say, oh, that's about Israel. That's not about us. And that's true. I think that's an important like question to ask. Who is being addressed here and does that apply? I don't actually think that's the biggest problem with this verse and many of the other ones I deal with in the book. There's a good question to be asked about, is it Israel? Is it the church? Is it other nations? There are passages in scripture that talk about the nations in general that we should heed. I think the bigger problem with this verse is the more insidious one and the one that deals more with the condition of our heart than like a list of rules for interpreting the Bible. And it's the way that we can take a verse like this, stick it up on a, you know, wall art <laughs> or embroider it on a pillow and associate it with certain images and ideas about American prosperity and goodness. So it goes back to the same shining city on a hill question of, you know, what is our idea of healing a land? What do we think that that looks like? What is a healed land? We bring a lot of our distinctly American modern ideas about what healing looks like into that passage. And then that really highlights why it's a problem that this is a promise to Israel and not to us, which is to say we're not promised, any earthly nation today is not promised healing, at least according to the terms that, that we have decided healing should look like. And so it is good for every nation to turn and seek God. It's good for communities and individuals within those nations to seek God and repent of their sins. But we as a nation are not promised healing on this, on you know, at all. We are awaiting a fuller healing in eternity for the people of God. And that doesn't seem like a big deal. Like we're just sort of confusing terms or we're not understanding who's being addressed. What matters is what kind of end are we oriented towards? Are we oriented towards an end of mm -hmm. the redemption and restoration of our bodies and all creation in which we live in community and God is present with God's people from every nation and every tongue? Or are we awaiting America becoming financially prosperous and militarily strong? And it's easy for us to think that we're awaiting that first. And by the way that we're formed in our political lives and the way that we slowly learn to interpret these verses, really awaiting that second. And that can be really disastrous for Christians, I think. I'm Patrick. Thanks for watching this video. If you're passionate about ending tribalism in the church and giving Jesus your allegiance, you're not alone. We have a podcast and a book. They're both called Truth Over Tribe. You can download the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can buy the book on Amazon. I hope you'll check them out.